if the Chinese produce goods that the world wants to buy, and they say that you need to pay yuan for these goods, not dollars, to the extent that people want those products, they're going to need yuan to pay for I them. I think we I mean, may have it. empty Walmarts and, and, and uh, Kmarts, but I don't think we would have empty supermarkets. And, and that is what China would have if this happened. Everybody has just been conditioned to think that, well, the Fed can fix every problem. We'll just print some money. Right? I mean, what everybody looks to government. Look at the State of the Union address that we just had. It's all about all this great stuff. China has easy money yes. policies right now. They're keeping interest rates low to prop up the banks. I, I get your point, Peter. I get your about, point. They, well, they... Hi, guys. Welcome. My name is uh, Liam Cosgrove. I'm a reporter with the Epoch Times. And today I'm joined by Peter Schiff, founder of Euro Pacific Asset Management, and Brent Johnson, founder of Santiago Capital. So in light of rising tensions over Taiwan and speculation that China might invade, many have been asking questions as to what the U.S. response might be to an invasion. Would we use military? Would we stick to economic means like sanctions, as we did with Russia? And we'll be discussing a scenario of who is, would win in an economic war, the U.S. or China. Peter will be taking the position that China comes out on top of that situation. And Brent will be arguing that the U.S. actually has the upper hand. Um, welcome to both of you guys. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I, th I think this will be a fun conversation. OK, so let's start off with uh, opening statements, kind of opening arguments. Peter, let's begin with you. Why is it that you think the U.S. Um, is going to would lose an economic war with China? Well, I don't think we have the, you know, the, the military, the artillery to actually fight a war with China. Uh, because China is our biggest supplier of goods and our biggest lender. I mean, sometimes it's it's Japan. I mean, China and Japan kind of take turns for America's biggest creditor. But certainly, our trade deficit is larger with China than it is with any other nation. And so America is more dependent on goods flowing in from China than it is from any other nation. And we don't have the ability to pay for those goods. We don't export goods to China. Uh, to cover the cost of those imports. We rely on the Chinese willingness to accept our, our dollars that we just create out of thin air. They don't cost us any money to create. I mean, we don't even have to print them anymore. So we don't have to spend the money on the paper or the ink. It's just a digital you know, electronic entry. Uh, so we create that and the Chinese supply us with all sorts of goods that we don't have the factories, the infrastructure, the trained workforce to produce ourselves. Uh, so we've got the Chinese doing all this work for us. Um, and so I think if we ever really went to war, if China basically decided, OK, I'm, we're just going to cut America off, we're not going to uh, be uh, shipping merchandise to the United States, nor are we going to be lending money to Americans. We're not going to buy any treasuries. We're not going to buy any uh, mortgage backed securities or any other dollar denominated debt. And as a matter of fact, we're going to start selling the debt that we already hold. Uh, to the extent that it matures, we're not going to roll it over and we're just going to unload our dollars and we're just going to buy gold instead. And I think that that would uh, create a massive uh, pandemonium here in the United States. There'd be a complete implosion. And, and, and then the question would be, how would you know, the authorities handle that? Because the only viable solution to that catastrophe would be massive cuts in government spending. Uh, dramatic uh, repeal of all sorts of rules and regulations so that we could try to rebuild a legitimate economy because the one we have right now is completely phony. It's a bubble that depends on countries like China supplying us with goods that we don't make and, and loaning us the money uh, to buy them. And so if all of a sudden you know, we have to you know, become self-sufficient, that's not going to happen with our current tax and regulatory uh, environment, you're going to have to see major reforms. But politically, that's not how the pendulum is swinging. Everybody wants bigger government, more government programs, more government spending. And so if we tried that in the aftermath of, you know, that type of economic war, we would take a horrible situation and just make it much worse. Okay. Thank you for that, Peter. Um, Brent, if you want to give either respond to what Peter said, or just kind of give your overview of why that you think the U.S. has the upper hand. Sure. Uh, I have to say off the top, I, I, have a, I had to laugh a little bit when, when Peter was taking the side of China, because I think he's probably the best person at describing free market economics, uh, but he's taking the side of a centrally planned economy, um, which is, yeah, I, I think the irony there is, 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 is a little too good not to mention. 
Uh, but, but essentially what I, what I would say in addition to that is that I don't think anybody wins the war. I, I think everybody gets hurt. Um, you know, to, to, I think to, to argue otherwise is a little uh, disingenuous. That said, we're talking about a relative victory here, uh, not, a, not an absolute victory. And, you know, even that itself is kind of a relative term. So it's hard, it's hard to envision a war with China where, where things come out positive for anybody. You know, that said, if it comes down to war and, and we've totally cut off from China or they've totally cut us off, however you want to describe that, it, it, it's, it's, it's bad for the U.S. But, and while the U.S. does not, is not currently self-sufficient, the United States is positioned to be more self-sufficient than any other country in the world. We have the most, or the best portfolio of real assets. Uh, we have the best farmland in the world. We have an ocean on four sides. We've got the Arctic Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the Pacific Ocean. I don't know. Maybe maybe you don't consider the Gulf of Mexico, and maybe that's just part of the Atlantic. And you know, if if, if China were to shut us off, then they're shutting Europe off as well because Europe is allied with the U.S. So they've just cut off their two biggest clients. Um, they the I think it goes back and forth on whether they export the most to the United States or whether they export the most to Europe. So. You know, if, if they've lost their two biggest clients, now they've got to start uh, selling internally. And they just do not yet have the economic capacity um, to, 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 to place all those goods internally. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, you, you could argue Say's law, you know, production equals demand. And that may be true, but not a current crisis. And then finally, if, if, if China is cutting off uh, the United States, then they're cutting off their U.S. dollar funding needs. And believe it or not, China has a huge currently has very large U.S. dollar funding needs. They have big exposures to, to U.S. dollar debt, and they have big exposure to needed inputs, commodities to run their economy that are traded in dollars. Uh, so I, th I think, you know, were this to happen um, on a relative basis, I think the U.S. comes out ahead. Okay, interesting. Peter, how do you respond to that, that, that Brent says the U.S. Is, is potentially in the best position in the world to be self-sufficient with our farmland, yeah, with well, our protective oceans? Sure, a couple of points. I recognize that you don't have a pure free market in China. I mean, not even close, but you don't have one in the United States either. I mean, our economy is pretty much centrally planned uh, to a large degree as well. I mean, what do you call the Federal Reserve? You have a group of central planners that have been uh, price fixing interest rates, and it's done tremendous damage to the structure of our economy. That's one of the reasons that we depend so much on the rest of the world because we don't save enough, we don't produce enough, and we rely on countries like China to do the production and the savings for us. And, and, and I do think that the idea that, you know, if China were to lose America as a customer, I think that's actually a plus for China because we're not a paying customer. They have to vendor finance us. I don't think the Chinese are, 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 are you know, benefiting by exchanging goods for paper. Uh, I think that the Chinese people would be much better off if they got to consume all the stuff that they're working hard to produce. And you're correct, at current prices, they can't afford it. But you adjust the exchange rates, the dollar crashes, which it would, I think, in this type of economic situation, and the Chinese currency goes up. Well, now, of course, the Chinese can afford uh, to produce the products. Yes, you're right. It's supply that creates its own demand. If you've got a situation where the Chinese have all this merchandise, that's not a problem. The problem is America with no merchandise and just a bunch of paper. Now, I agree with Brent that we have tremendous potential. We have lots of natural resources. We have lots of infrastructure. But how do we unlock that potential? I mean, right now, you talk about all these oceans. We have a huge trade deficit in, in fish. Why can't Americans catch fish? Why do we have to get fish from the rest of the world? You know, but you know, you need fishermen. Somebody has to go out there and know what they're doing. You have to have the equipment. You know, we, we, you know, we, we've been eating foreign fish for so long, we forgot how to catch them. That's the problem. You know, the longer America stays dependent on the rest of the world, the more screwed up the economy gets. You know, and, and, and we've enjoyed this privilege of issuing the world's reserve currency for a long time. And yes, it's, it, it's given us this advantage. We have a standard of living that's much higher than what we're entitled to based on our productivity. But the longer we can get away with it, the worse it's going to be when, you know, the tables are turned because the rest of the world uh, does not benefit from this relationship. It's not symbiotic. It's more parasitic. I mean, it, the world has to pay the cost to underwrite American profligacy. And the longer they let us get away with it, you know, the more expensive it becomes. And obviously it has to end at some point. You know, if President Lincoln said you could fool some of the people 
all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. I mean, eventually the world's going to wake up and, and, and this is going to come to an end. And so I, I think that, you know, the, the war is winnable because I think uh, the, the Chinese and other countries, you know, they're, 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 they're losing right now by maintaining this relationship. And I think that's why they are currently looking for alternatives. I mean, yes, the dollar, the Chinese right now, their economy does depend on a lot of things in dollars and they don't like that. And they are trying to wean themselves away from that so they can pull the plug. And, and even if they stop trading with Europe, and I know they do export a lot from Europe and they also import from Europe. They don't have the huge imbalance with Europe that they have with the United States. Um, because you know, Europe as a community has relatively balanced trade, but you know they could trade with India. They could trade with all sorts of other countries that aren't in Europe or the United States. They could trade with South America, uh, but again, they've got a huge market of people. Uh, the the whole purpose of trade, the only reason you export is to import. That's basically it, uh, because it's comparative advantage. If you know if uh, the Americans make something more efficiently than the Chinese. It's better for the Chinese to make something else and then trade rather than make something themselves that could be imported for an expenditure of less resources. But if you're just exporting for, the, you know, just to get paper money, uh, you know, you're not accomplishing anything. And, and so they don't need to export to the United States if they if it's not to facilitate the, the payment of imports. And they, so they'll just consume uh, what they what they produce. But, you know, just imagine life in America. You know, you go into a, a Walmart and the shelves are empty. You know, I mean, we saw a little bit of that during COVID, but, you know, <laughs> it could get a lot worse. Brent, what do you think about that? So I guess the argument is China could pivot. It could consume its own goods or it could trade with a different trading partner if, if they would accept Chinese currency, um, whereas the U.S. might literally have empty supermarkets. What, what do you say to that? Well, I think I, I think I'd make a distinguishment here. I think we may have empty WalMarts and and, and uh, Kmart's, but I don't think we would have empty supermarkets. And, and that is what China would have if this happened, because you know a lot of it gets talked about how the U.S. is dependent on the rest of the world to send us our goods. But in that case, we're talking about high-end watches, we're talking about computers, we're talking about clothing, shoes. We're not talking about wheat. We're not talking about corn. We're not talking about beef or chicken. Uh, we're, we're not talking about oil. Uh, but that's what China needs from the rest of the world. China needs energy, both oil and natural gas, and they need food from the rest of the world. So on or again, if, we, if we're talking about everybody getting hurt and our, and our Kmarts and Walmarts are empty, I think that's relatively better off than my supermarket being empty. Uh, because when, you're, when you don't have a, a TV, you're annoyed. When you don't have food, you're mad. And you don't, when you don't have TV, you're probably not going to start a revolution. But if you it's don't have like food or heat, you, you might start a yeah, revolution. It, it, it's not like they don't have any farms in China, but I agree the Chinese import a lot of uh, raw materials. But you know they can import from Brazil. They, you know there's you know there's they can they they can no. get stuff from Africa. I mean they're you know no, they, but, they, okay, they, but but if that happens, I, I hear what you're saying. But if that happens, if if we are literally this, we are not going to get to the situation where there is no trade between the United States and China without it being a war, an actual war. Um, I cannot foresee a situation where we just don't trade with that half of the world and everything is fine from a military perspective. I believe that that would actually, unfortunately, cause an actual war. And in that scenario, the ships are not sailing from Brazil to China without being intercepted or blockaded or in some form. And I'm yeah. not sure that in that scenario that Brazil would actually continue to sell to China. They may want to, but that, that means that they are now choosing China over the United States. And while that's kind of a popular theory, in reality, I think it would be much different. Well, it's not so much a, a choice, the government. I mean, it, the, the people, if people want Chinese products. Uh, how do they get them? Well, they have to they have to export something. You know, they export food and they can import these products. But I agree with you. We're, we're not likely to get to a situation where, you know, this happens by government decree. But I do think that ultimately, over time, the dollar is going to lose this reserve status and then trade with China is going to collapse on its own because the dollar is going to collapse and Americans aren't going to be able to afford all of these Chinese products. So the Chinese will either trade with other people who can afford to pay for their products with with other products or the Chinese people will just start consuming a lot more on their own, which is going to be great for them. You know, they'll have higher standards of living. 
No, I would just say that, that this idea that, um, you know, the U.S. is going to go in some kind of a, I don't know, recession or self-imposed, you know, uh, dystopian society because we're not trading with the rest of the world. And all of a sudden, the rest of the world is going to start trading with each other and everything's going to be fine, I think is completely wrong. Uh, if you look over the last 25 years, there's never been a time where the U.S. went into a downturn or a recession and the, and the rest of the world thrived. In fact, the rest of the world typically follows the U.S. down when that happens. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is I don't think it's a given. And in fact, I would argue strongly the other way that if you know we cut each other off, that it's the, the Chinese yuan that, is, that appreciates versus the U.S. dollar. Uh, there is very little next to zero demand for yuan outside of China. There is incredible demand for dollars outside the United States. And if everybody starts defaulting on their dollar debts and using the dollar outside the United States, that's actually hurting the rest of the world because the rest of the world holds a significant amount of their reserves in U.S. dollars and in U.S. dollar liabilities. And so if all of a sudden those gets defaulted on, yeah, the demand for the dollar falls, but the supply of the dollar uh, well, falls even more. But if the Chinese produce goods that the world wants to buy and they say that you need to pay yuan for these goods, not dollars, to the extent that people want those products, they're going to need yuan to pay for them. I mean, that's that's where the demand comes from. It's the the productive capacity of the nation. And if you need that currency because you need their products, well, then you need the currency. I mean, right now, the main demand for the dollar is not for our products, not that we don't have any products, but our biggest product is our debt. And so people want dollars to buy treasuries. You know, God knows why, but that's what they do. That's what they do with them. Or they buy, you know, other financial assets, or maybe they they buy uh, U.S. stocks. Uh, or they the service dollars. their U.S. dollar debt. That that's the biggest driver. Uh, yeah, although one day their U.S. dollar debt is just going to be repudiated, that, you know, with inflation. So that's that's the least of their worries long term, uh, because the U.S. government is the biggest U.S. dollar debtor. You know, we got a thirty-one and a half trillion dollar debt. And it's unpayable. And so the only viable political way forward is to inflate that debt away. Well, when the U.S. government inflates its debt away, it inflates away everybody's debt. You know, it's, it's, how, it's, how does how does China inflate away their 300 uh, percent total debt to GDP? How do how do they get out from underneath that big debt burden? Well, it's not where you, this is you're talking about all the, the debt. Uh, the, it's not the, look at all. If you look at all the assets in the banking system compared to their yeah, GDP, but you're not talking which, about that's not government debt. You're talking about like no, but that's corporate debt. debt. But isn't yeah, corporate but debt? I'm important? not talking about our corporate debt. We got corporate debt. We got municipal debt. We got un, we got tons of debt. We got you know we 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 got more debt than anybody. Um, but you know, you know, obviously, look, the Chinese economy uh, has some problems, and there's going to be defaults. There's going to be bankruptcies. I mean. The whole world's kind of screwed up because it's been on this U.S. dollar reserve system. Uh, we haven't had real money since 1971. So we got 50 years of funny money and central planning when it comes to interest rates. And, you know, and, and so the whole world is screwed up. I'm not saying that it's paradise over there in China, uh, but I'm just talking about on a relative basis, which country is the most screwed up? And I would say that our economy is more screwed up because we have been the primary beneficiary of this monetary system. And so our economy has evolved with that crutch, with the crutch of not having to produce uh, and not having to save. And, and so it's not going to, you know, we're not gonna be able to turn on a light switch and reprogram everybody in America and, and, and give them the bad news that, hey, it's time to go back to work. Everybody has just been conditioned to think that, well, the Fed can fix every problem. We'll just print some money, right? I mean, what, everybody looks to government. Look at the State of the Union address that we just had. It's all about all this great stuff that the government's going to do. Nobody talks about capitalism or freedom. Everybody expects the government to hand them everything on a silver platter. Well, so far, the government's been handing them the stuff that the Chinese have been putting on that platter. You know, well, you know, when, when the platter's empty, I mean, it's going to be a rude awakening. Well, I, I listen, I agree with that. We're going to the whole world is, is in for a rude awakening. Peter, what do you say to Brent's point about, you know, the U.S. is a net exporter of food, net, net exporter of natural gas. So aren't, aren't those yeah. big advantages for us? Yeah, look, it's a good thing that we're blessed with natural resources. You know, imagine if we were like Japan or something. I mean, we, we couldn't even survive. Uh, if we were in their situation. So, it, it, you know, it's a good thing we've got those things. Um, 
But, you know, I think if you actually think about it and you look at the relationship that America has with, with China and you just, you know, look at what we sell them and what they sell us. And if you didn't know anything, if you were just like on another planet and you said, hey, here's these two countries, one of them grows shit and takes stuff out of the ground, raw materials, and sends it to this other country, which sends back all these manufactured finished goods and stuff like that. I mean, China would look like the real economic power. We're like, you know, uh, you know, a, a little colony of China. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're sending them stuff that grows <laughs> and they're making all the stuff that, you know, where you need factories. So they've got all the economic industrial might. All we got is a bunch of farmers, not, not to belittle them, but that's, that's just harvesting, you know, what, we, what we've got from God. I mean, you know, we're, we don't have the industrial uh, might that we once had. You know, because you look at what America's exports were 50, 60, 70 years ago, we were exporting manufactured goods. That's, that, was, that dwarfed our agriculture. You know, that's what we were giving everybody. Uh, automobiles, you know, refrigerators, washer dryers, television sets, cameras, you know, all, all the stuff, all the quality stuff was all made here. Nobody would make crap, would buy anything made in Japan, right? It was a joke. So it just, just shows you how much everything has switched when you just look at the, you know, the, the terms of trade and, and, and what we produce and sell and what we have to import. Brent, one question I have for you is um, yep. Peter's point about, you know, if we did cut them off, China could go to buy things from Brazil, uh, different countries. Why would that be so hard? I guess you, you think the U.S. Would, would use military to prevent that from happening? Well, I, I think they would use all means necessary to prevent that from happening. Now, would they start off right away with military? Probably not, but they could very easily say to Brazil, hey, who, whose side are you on? Are you on China's side or are you on our side? You know, China's halfway around the world. We're, we're just north of you. You know, you, we do a lot of trade with you as well. Um, you know, you're either with us against us. Now, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm just saying that's what they would do. It's, you know, it's kind of a what no, more, more, versus reality. More likely, they're going to say, you know, our missiles are a lot closer to you than their missiles. So, you well, that, this, that, so hey, you know what? <laughs> that, 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 that's very possible as well. That's very possible because, as well. And so, so this, this idea that, you know, the rest of the world will just start trading with China and, and you know, push the United States to the side, I think history says otherwise. You know, to just look at what's happened in the last year. In the last uh, year, year and a half, um, you know, Europe is in the process of being deindustrialized. You know, they, they, they didn't go with Russia on the natural gas. They continued to side with the United States. And so there's private equity firms right now, U.S. and North American private equity firms over in Europe right now buying up, uh, you know, energy assets at 20 cents on the dollar because, you know, industry is leaving Germany. Uh, German, German auto manufacturing is, is uh, the, they've, they've, they've made decisions to move some of their, more, more of their production, not all of it, more of their production to Alabama. Um, you know, so you, you have these situations where despite the pain that it's causing them, um, Europe so far is still choosing to side with the United States. Now, it's not pretty and it's not fun and it doesn't mean that it's going to work out great for anybody, but I don't see, you know, the Germans rushing off to Beijing to, to, to side with them rather than Washington. Yeah, right. again, Washington's influence is going to fade, you know, all, you know as we get deeper and deeper into debt. Um, you know, our, our influence and eventually our military. Look, I mean, you remember the Soviet Union. I mean, think about the, the power that everybody assumed the Soviet Union had during the 1960s and the 1970s. I mean, they disappeared almost overnight, you know, in, in the late 80s when the whole thing fell apart. But leading up to it, I mean, you know, the Soviet Union was this gigantic superpower and then it then it was nothing. So I, I, I would argue that's China today. Well, no, you, you, I mean, just, you just did a very good job of explaining no. China. Thank you for my argument. We okay. didn't buy anything from the Soviet Union. They didn't make shit. They couldn't even feed themselves. We had to loan them money to buy our wheat. You know, they, 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 we didn't have a trade deficit with with the Soviet Union. What, they didn't make anything. I mean, the only thing but they you, make. You, they, you know who we did? You know who we did have a trade Perfect. deficit with? You know who we did have a trade deficit with? Who? And there's a, and there's a lot of parallels with with, with Japan. Japan was a manufacturing power. They yes, had we had a real estate, yeah, but, and then they had a huge real estate boom, and they were the up and coming. You know, we still uh, well, we still have a deficit with Japan. But yes, the, the mistake that Japan made after well, first of all, the mistake that they made during the eighties was 
not allowing the, the yen to appreciate more. They began to get concerned about the weakness of the U.S. dollar, and so they printed too much money, and they kept interest rates too low, and that really fueled the bubble in stocks and real estate. And then when it burst, instead of allowing the free market to purge the economy of all the zombie companies and reallocate resources and, and do the right thing, they constantly intervened and they, they, the politicians were under pressure to do things and, and all they did was harm. And of course, they continued to have this foolish policy of creating inflation. We need more inflation. We need low interest rates. And it was compounded by the fact that the U.S., you know, we brought our interest rates down to zero. And so then they're like, screw, how do we get under zero? We got to go negative. I mean, you know, so, you know, they should have just allowed their economy to restructure and allowed the dollar to collapse against the yen. They should have let the yen go up. They should have allowed uh, everything. And now, you know, the Japanese government has a ton of debt. You know, they borrowed all that money to prop up the U.S. economy. You know, because they but thought isn't that, that what would China their own economy. But isn't this is what China's doing right now? China's China has e China has easy money. China has easy money yes. policies right now. They're keeping interest rates low to prop up the banks. They've got all these. Yes, cost we agree. So China's doing exactly what Japan did. Up, we have screwed up everybody. Everybody's <laughs> economy is screwed up because yeah. we are the reserve currency and we are basically, you know, calling the tune and everybody is dancing. But yeah. when you look beneath the surface, what countries have the productive capacity? That's the key. That's where wealth comes from. Who has the factories? Who has the infrastructure, the supply chain to produce the stuff that people want? It's not the United States. China has that a lot more than we do. But they don't have the inputs. They don't. They have the capacity, but they the don't have the raw materials inputs. are easy to source, and you know they're doing it. They're Hold getting on. deals all over. They're the easy world. to source. They're easy to source right now, but in a scenario of war, they are not easy to source. And I think you would agree that war is inflationary for everybody. Well, well, war itself isn't inflationary. It's the money they print to pay for the wars that's inflationary. There's no no supply chain issues during war. Well, then, price, well, yeah, but then they should, if money supply went down and, you know, the prices wouldn't go up, you just have shortages, you know. Um, and so, it, so right now, so well, right now, right now, it, money supply in the United States is falling and money supply in China is growing. So is that is that a fa in favor of the United States or China? Well, money supply is is falling temporarily in the United States because it rose so massively, you know, in the last several years. But this, that won't last. You know, money supply is uh, is going to go up as soon as the Fed goes right back to QE, which it's it's going to be doing. But credit is growing. I don't know. You know, you're looking at money supply, but, you know, inflation is also, you know, this expansion of credit and credit is still available. I mean, people are borrowing like crazy. Uh, you know, now some of these companies look, a firm came out, one of these big buy now and pay now pay later places. You know, maybe they finding out it's buy now and pay never because the stock cratered, you know, because people aren't, you know, paying back the money they owe. But uh, people have been able to access credit. I mean, credit card debt is still at a record uh, low, high. Uh, savings are basically a record low. And so this is also fueling, uh, you know, prices because people are able to borrow to buy stuff. So uh, that's kind of replacing some of the decline in money supply, which, which won't last you know, the, the official money supply, they're going to they're gonna turn those spigots on at the first sign of trouble. Uh, let me jump in here, Brent. So um, is your long-term view different than your short-term view? So like what Peter says about at the end of the day, people are buying most items from China. The dollar is currently the global reserve, but does there come a day when people, you know, if China used that leverage and said no more stuff unless you use Yuan, could they eventually upset our global reserve status? So I think that our global reserve status will change. I think there will be a transition period. The U.S. dollar will not stay the global reserve currency forever. I don't think it will be due to anything that China does. I think it will be more due to just the general, as Peter has very eloquently said, the amount of debt and the amount of the, the way this whole system is screwed up, I think will necessitate a change in the system and a transition to the system. And on the other side of that transition, you know, the dollar probably falls in value, loses its status. You know, I think that could take a lot longer than most other people, but, but I do think that will eventually happen. But what I don't think will happen is I do not think that there will be a transition and we end up with another system where in that transition period, the dollar does not go higher. 
I don't think that we can go to a new system where the dollar is no longer the global reserve currency, where in that interim, the dollar did not go dramatically higher. That's a key point of disagreement because I don't think the dollar loses its status because of its strength. I think it's the weakness of the dollar that ultimately undoes its status. I mean, as long as the dollar is sound, uh, I think it can continue. I think what, what happens with all the debt is the world re recognizes that it's unpayable and that the United States is insolvent. You know, we, we keep reminding the world that we're insolvent every time we go through one of these, you know, charades with, with the debt ceiling. What does the Secretary of the Treasury, what does the Federal Reserve Chairman, what does the President say is going to happen if we don't raise the debt? They say, well, we're going to default. If we don't raise the debt, we default on U.S. Treasuries. So that's an admission that we're running this gigantic Ponzi scheme and that default is eventually inevitable because nobody is saying, well, if we can't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to cut Social Security. We're going to cut Medicare. We're going to raise taxes because we're going to pay our bills. We're going to pay the interest on the debt. We're going to pay the principal. No, they're saying if we can't borrow more money from the rest of the world, well, then we're not going to pay back any of the money that we've already borrowed. So it's like we're running a Ponzi scheme. And so if the world eventually says, you know, we don't want to participate in a Ponzi scheme anymore because we know how Ponzi schemes end, you know, then there's a run on the dollar. There's a run on treasuries because the one Peter ceiling, that, the one, let me finish this one point, the one ceiling that we can't raise is the lending ceiling. See, the, the debt ceiling is self-imposed. We can keep raising it and, because that's how much money we want to borrow. But the ceiling that we can't lay, raise is how much money the world wants to lend. And when America's creditors are no mas, we don't want to loan you any more money because you can't possibly pay us back the money we've already loaned you. We're done throwing good money after bad. That's when everything collapses. And that's with dollar weakness, not strength. So I, I would concede Peter's point. This someday will happen. But the point I would very much like to make is everything that Peter is talking about happening to the dollar one day in the future is already happening right, right now today in Japan and Europe. Nobody, you know, when, when there's a Japanese government bond auction, the Japanese or the BOJ is the biggest buyer. Nobody's, no foreigners are running over there and buying, you know, trillions of dollars worth of Japanese government bonds. Um, the ECB is currently monetizing almost all of the debt of the, of the periphery countries. Even though they're raising rates, they're doing QE at the same time. Um, meanwhile, over the last month, Every time the Treasury has issued had, had Treasury auctions, there has been record number of foreigners, indirect bidders, showing up to buy the Treasuries. So the point Peter makes is good. There, there will come a point where this happens, and that's why I think eventually, you know, the dollar, you know, days will be numbered. But all of the worries that people associate with the dollar are already happening right now today to, the, to its competitor currencies. And so on a relative basis, I think the U.S. and the U.S. dollar are actually sitting in pretty good position. Well, I think we're only in a good position because of the perception and the dollar's role as the reserve currency. It's like whenever there's a problem in the world, people buy dollars, even if that problem is in the United States. And I think that the best example of the absurdity of this, if you recall, the only time that a rating agency downgraded U.S. Treasury debt, you know, I do remember had this. Standard & Poor's, and they, they went from AAA or wherever it was to AA or whatever they did. And... The, the stock market didn't like that. But when that happened, there was this so-called flight to quality and people bought U.S. Treasuries on the downgrade of U.S. Treasuries. So, I mean, how can that be? That doesn't make any sense. So that shows you that we even benefit from our own problems because it causes yeah. people to want to loan us even more money so we can make those problems even worse. See, this system should have unraveled a long time ago. The fact that it hasn't means that the economy of the United States is just that much more screwed up than it was you know, years or decades past. And so you're right, eventually it, it, it ends, but the sooner the better from the perspective of the longer it takes, the worse it's gonna be. Well, so quick question then, how has it hold, held on for so long? Is it, uh, Brent, what do you think? Is it petrodollar? I think, it's, I, I think there's a, it's a combination of things. One, um, we have the biggest, deepest capital market, so it has the best liquidity. Number two, we are most countries' biggest client. So if you're going to trade with us and you want access to our markets, then you need dollars and you, know, you need to be in the good graces of the United States. So that's part of it. The third part of it is because everybody trades with us, then they actually 
get a, if they borrow in dollars, they get a lower rate. So people, countries have taken out a lot of US dollar debt. That kind of creates its own demand for the debt. And then finally, um, I think to the certain extent, the US, and, and, it, and to, it would happen to a greater extent if necessary, the US military backs it up as well. So there's a number of factors that, uh, that lead to the dollar lasting longer than, than many people think that it probably should. And one thing I would say, would, again, I think P P Peter makes fantastic points with how the system is screwed up and how you know, it's all backwards and people think of it wrong. But for the rest of the world to you know, come to the realization that we are running a quote unquote Ponzi scheme and no longer want to deal with it and no longer want to do it, then they also would also, because their systems run on the exact same scenario that ours run on, they would have to admit that their systems are Ponzi mm -hmm. schemes as well. So you know, they would have to restructure their own economies as well and structure the design of their monetary yeah. system and their own central bank would have to come up with a whole new way of doing things. So it's not as easy in a free market scenario, I, I maybe perhaps Peter's position is right, but I, I just don't see the world having this grand aha moment in a moment of clarity and moving on and, and everything's all of a sudden, you know, bad for the US and great for everybody else. I mean, who, yeah, who knows? I mean, I mean, I, I mean I'm not the only one that's been pointing this out. So it's not like, you know, the, the world should know. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, just like I was warning about the housing bubble and the subprime yeah. problem, nobody paid attention to me and then, then it happened. So I mean, happened. People, there are people that are, that are, that are warning about this. And yeah, America has done an excellent job of basically getting the world to believe that it's dependent on the U S dollar, which we have a monopoly on the ability to create out of thin air and, you know, seniorage gains. I mean, we, 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 we've taken that to, you know, the, the height of any of any yeah. country in the history of the world but you know nothing that can't go on forever will and it's going to end yeah i mean look i mean i've been saying it's going to end for 20 years you know and here it is we're still here so you know is it possible that i could be saying this for another 20 years yeah i mean of course it's possible but Im imagine where the national debt would be 20 years from now you know i, I mean it, 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 you know it's so it, 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 it at some point this has got to end. It can't just the yeah. numbers are just so big and it starts to become exponential. So just thinking, well, you know, it's, it can keep going on for a long time. You can think that way until all of a sudden it's a crisis. I mean, we're here in Puerto Rico and I even remember before Puerto Rico had its sovereign debt crisis and if they had a default and, you know, we eventually restructured. It. I forget what we agreed to pay, but we can't even pay what we agreed to pay, which was maybe 20 cents on the dollar. But before Puerto Rico had its debt problem, it was already broke. It was obvious that Puerto Rico borrowed too much money, but no one cared. All these funds kept buying the muni bonds. And so yeah. as long as the mutual funds wanted these tax-free uh, Puerto Rican bonds, the Puerto Rican government kept borrowing money and selling bonds. And no one gave a damn until all of a sudden people worried about it. And then it was a crisis, right? It's not a problem until people worry about it. And, and so right now, no one's worried about this giant Ponzi scheme or our unpayable debt or the prospect of hyperinflation, just like they weren't worried about Greece until all of a sudden they were worried about Greece, you know, and you, know, you don't hear too much about it anymore. Uh, but, you know, it just comes out of the blue, like, oh, all of a sudden the bond market is finally awake and worried about a, a, a cunt, an entity that's bankrupt. So it is going to happen. And, you know, it could be a long time from now, or it could be tomorrow. And since we don't know, I mean, that's just my thing. I don't know when it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I just don't know when. So I think the best thing is to just be prepared for it so that when it does happen, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're ready, you know, and even if it happens later, okay, I've been, I've been ready for a long time. I mean, people buy, you know, insurance, you know, they don't know when they're going to have an accident or when they're going to need it. They just want to make sure that they have it in case they need it. Because if you wait, you know, they won't sell you a, a fire insurance policy after your house burns down. You know, you have to buy it before it's on fire. Right. But Peter, isn't some of it more than just kind of belief? Like, um, you know, when you have Saudi Arabia exclusively selling oil in dollars, that's that's more than just like faith in the dollar, yeah. keeping it alive. That's, you know, you have to transact in the dollar in some, in yeah, some situations. Look, that's not an accident either. You know, I mean, right. you know, we, we went off the gold standard. Nixon had to do something. And so we, we got the, the, the Saudis to, to, to participate. But will Saudi Arabia be selling uh, its oil for dollars in 50 years? No. Will it be doing it in 10 years? Probably not. Five years? Mm, we'll see. You know, I mean, I clearly know that they don't want to. 
I mean, if I was Saudi Arabia, not that I have, you know, any conversation with the Saudis, but if I was, you know, in Saudi Arabia and I was taking a look at the situation today with Russia and I would be like, I don't want that happening to me, you know, um, and I would be doing everything I can to try to get out from under being dependent on the U.S. dollar. You don't want to have that kind of weapon uh, in the hands of a potential adversary. I mean, you know, I mean, the Saudis could easily find themselves uh, in, in the position that Russia's in and they don't want to be. Nobody wants to be in that position. So, you know, by weaponizing the, the dollar and the Swiss system, all that, we've just created yet another reason for the world to want to get rid of it. So it's, it's, it's going to happen. And, you know, one other thing, point I wanted to make, too, about the politics, I, before I forget, you know, this, you know, maybe Brad can comment, but, you know, as far as China and the United States, you know, the Chinese have a luxury that we don't have. See, the Chinese leaders don't have to get elected. They don't have to do stupid things to get elected. They, they can do the right thing and uh, allow, uh, the, you know, the bitter medicine to go down. But American politicians will never do the right thing because that means they're not going to get reelected. So the politics are a lot different here. You know, there's so much pressure uh, to do the wrong thing economically in the United States. And, you know, they, they won't have as much pressure in China. Brent, let me get your opinion on, on what Peter said about uh, Russia. And we, we took them off swift. And that was yet another reason to leave the dollar. And if Saudi Arabia, how much importance do you place in the petrodollar? If Saudi Arabia starts selling in yuan or another currency, how big of a deal do you think that is? Okay, so with regard to, you know, the U.S. weaponizing the dollar, taking people off SWIFT, sanctioning them, um, yeah, that, that's, you know, that's, unfortunately, that's, a, that's, a, that's what hegemons do. That's what people that run the world do. They're power hungry. They want to stay in power. They overplay their hand. They, 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 they bully others. And, you know, I don't necessarily advocate for that, but I recognize that's the way it's done. One thing I would say, though, is before you start moralizing about the evils of the United States, all countries, all governments do this on a domestic basis to their own citizens. You know, they tax their citizens. They throw them in jail. They, you know, they, they, they you know, China recently confiscated all of Jack Ma's assets because they didn't like what he was doing. So, you know, the idea that somehow our politicians are these evil beings and the rest of the world's politicians are these, you know, you know, very well-intentioned and, you know, nice people that would never, ever confiscate yeah. anybody well, else. No, it's, not moralizing. It's, more, it's not I'm moralizing. Not He's more saying do, in, in doing that, or is it actually to our disadvantage? Because then Saudi Arabia sees what we well, did. So in the long term, yes. And the more you bully somebody, eventually they are going to stand up to you. But the reason, okay, this gets a little philosophical, but the reason that bullies exist is because it works. If you tell somebody that you, you want them to do something or else you're going to punch them in the nose, they don't do it and you're bigger than them and you, you punch them in the nose, they, could, they typically go do it. You know, if, if, if it didn't work, bullies wouldn't exist in the first place. So I think, again, it gets back to this, what should it be done? That's the question for somebody else. Will it be done? It will absolutely be done. So that, that's what I would say with regard to the way the U.S. acts towards the rest of the world. But um, if you want to use this bully, the bully, one way to avoid a bully is like, if you know where the bully is, try to, you know, try to avoid them if you can, right? Just don't, you know, sure. don't, don't. So don't there's a, there's so a very good what... movie. There's a very good movie called Syriana. It came out about 20 years ago and it has George Clooney in it. And it's really based exactly on what we're talking about right here. It's like two Saudi princes were kind of vying for who was going to run the country now that their father was dying. One of them wanted to kind of open it up and, get kind of, uh, you know, multiple bids and sell oil in different uh, currencies. And the United States went in and supported his brother and they took out the brother that wanted to sell another currency. So, you know, that's unfortunately the way the world works now. Yeah, Would but that my happen point, in the real world? I, my point I, I get about, your point, Peter. I get your yeah, but, point. They, well, they want to case, get away from the world. They want well, to just, get away from... Just in case ahead. somebody watching it doesn't get the point that I was I'm going to make, it's right. that... You know, if we've got this bully that's beating up kids in the playground, other people are going to avoid that playground. I don't want to. I don't want to be over there. This bully is going to going to going to beat me up. And so yeah. my point is, other people are looking at the the beating, so to speak, that Russia is taking, and they're saying, "Hey, I don't I don't want that to happen to me." So they don't want to go in the playground. That's why they want to try to get away from the U.S. dollar. 
and yes. trading in dollars and, and all that, because to the extent that they're off the dollar system and they're on some new system, and if their reserve assets are not dollars, let's say they're gold, uh, then you know they don't have to worry about the sanctions. They're not going to have any any impact. So they people want to be in a position where they can't be sanctioned. The reason that everybody is so vulnerable to sanctions is because they've got themselves so deeply entrenched in the dollar. So they got to get out. That's my point. What, what America should be doing? Because I mean, we uh, if, if our leaders recognized how important it was to continuing this. That, that the world continue to keep the dollar as the reserve currency, they should do nothing to, you know, shake that, to rattle that, to bite the hands that are feeding us. They, the last thing we should do, we should, we should say it's sacrifice. No, no, no matter what you do wrong, we're not going to sanction you with the dollar or SWIFT. You know, we'll have to think of something else. We can do tariffs or we can do whatever. But no, no, that's off limits. That, that's what we should be doing, right, to create that precedent. Uh, but, you know, we're not doing that. We're doing we're doing everything we can to to unravel it. And it's because I don't think our leaders really are smart enough to understand what's at stake here and what they're doing. Well, there's two. So you guys are kind of agreeing, but offering two different strategies. Peter's saying if they understood it, they would try to be the best customers possible. Brent is saying they actually do understand it and they'll just use military might. They'll they'll do CIA backed coups to, you know, make sure that the dollar is stays as, as its hegemony. Um, but Brent, what do you what do you think about the feasibility of that? Like, so you're kind of arguing that yeah. the leaders understand well, so, the importance of it, yeah. but can they maintain it? So I, th in my opinion, I think both the US at a very high level, maybe not individual Congress people in general, but I think the deep state or the, however you want to describe kind of the, the Washington machine understands the importance of the dollar. And I think that they understand um, that keeping the dollar as a global reserve currency is kind of key to the United States saying the, uh, as the global power. Um, and so I think that, you know, they would, while they would like it to be where everybody just happily goes along with what they say, and they would like everybody to like them, I think in a, you know, at the end of the day, if, if they don't really care whether anybody likes them as long as they play along, right? And if, and to Peter's point, I completely agree with them that the people don't like the bully. Nobody likes the bully. They maybe they cozy up to the bully more for protection than because they actually than because they like them. Um, but it's you know again, there's this kind of sort of romantic notion that all you have to do is walk up and punch the bully in the nose, and the bully goes away. And once in a while that does happen. But usually what happens is when you attack the bully, the bully beats you up and you go away bleeding. I mean that's typically what happens. So the idea that uh, that the worst the world wants to get away from the dollar, completely agree. The idea that they can do so and do so successfully, and that in that interim period, the dollar won't go a lot higher and hurt them even more, I think is very low probability. And Brent, real quick, I did want to ask you about the petrodollar. Some people argue that it's not really so important anymore. Some people think that it's literally the linchpin that's holding it all together. What do you think on that? Well, I, I have two, two, two thoughts on it. One, it's not as important as a, it's still, it's still very important. So I'm not going to pretend it's not, it's very important. Um, but because of all the US dollar debt that the rest of the world has issued, it's not as important as it used to be because there's another, now there's another driver that didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago for dollar demand that, 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 uh, that existed, um, that didn't exist now then, but does exist now. You know, I, I don't think that the, the U.S. would mind if a little bit of trade is done in, in other currencies. They certainly don't want it to become a huge trend. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if, 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 if Saudi Arabia continues to price uh, the dollar in the, the oil in dollars, but trades a little bit with some countries on the margins in, in another currency, but it's still priced in dollars, I think that I think that's fine. But I think if, if, if Saudi Arabia tried to completely change the structure and no longer price it, you know, oil in dollars and price it, you know, and do equal trade in yuan or whatever it is, I think that there would be huge geopolitical pushback. I think it would lead to some kind of not only an economic crisis, but probably a military crisis. And in that environment, I think the dollar goes a lot higher. Peter, I've heard you talk about in your podcast before that you view the massive treasury holdings of the Chinese as a potential economic weapon, where if they were to dump it on the open market, 
they tank the price of treasuries, interest rates skyrocket. Um, do you think that's a, you know, something they might pull in sort of a, you know, as tensions rise over Taiwan and, you know, if we tried sanctions, would they try something like that? Well, I mean, I think they're already, you know, trying to diminish the size of, of their treasury holdings. I mean, they're not nearly as big a buyer as they were. Um, but I mean, I think it's a huge liability for the Chinese to hold so much of our debt. And I also think that the more of our debt they have, not only is it that we're less likely to repay them, you know, because we're more likely to inflate, but it's also possible that we'll just tell the Chinese, we're not going to pay your treasuries. That's how we're going to sanction you, right? The treasuries that you own are no good, right? Everybody else's treasuries are okay, but we're just going to cancel the ones that you own, right? That's part of a sanction or something like that. So, you know, because politically, it's a lot easier for the U.S. government to default on the obligations to pay China than to default on the obligations to make Social Security payments because the Chinese don't vote in our elections, whereas people who are collecting Social Security do. So if the government has to choose, hey, who do we pay, Social Security or the Chinese, well, you know, the Chinese are going to lose that. And they have to recognize that they are in a very vulnerable position and they can't sue us. I mean, what are they going to do? We just, we're not, you, 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 there's no way. We just tell them, hey, this is the deal. You're not getting, you know, your money. Uh, so they're going to have to stop. Uh, but I do think that if they started dumping, you know, would that immediately crash the dollar in the bond market? I mean, obviously the Fed would step up and start buying. So, I mean, maybe it would crash it. Uh, you know, it certainly would diminish the value of treasuries. It'd go down, rates would go up. Uh, the dollar would go down. I don't know if it would immediately crash, but it may be the beginning of a ultimate collapse because I think if the Chinese do that, well, you know, they're not going to be the only ones that do that. And, you know, as we lose these foreign buyers, I mean, Brent mentioned that there have been a lot of foreign buyers who have showed up at those treasury auctions. Uh, what happens if they stop showing up? I mean, it's, it's certainly not in their interest to show up, I don't think, but especially when they realize that inflation is going to be much higher in the United States, uh, we're never going to have positive rates of interest. So treasuries are never going to be a winning investment for people. It, they're just going to have to accept the losses. Well, you know, why, why should they? Why should people accept losing money in treasuries? Why, why buy them? Just don't. And, and, and so then, you know, when the Federal Reserve is the only buyer of treasuries, you know, that, that, that's massive inflation. Because where do they get the money? And, you know, if the Fed becomes the only buyer of treasuries, no one's going to want to buy muni bonds. No one's going to want to buy corporate bonds, not at yields that anybody can afford. So, that you know, those bonds are going to start to crash. Rates are going to start to rise. And the Fed's probably going to start monetizing all that debt. Um, and, 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 then, and then it would collapse the currency. So certainly, you know, whether the Chinese can collapse the dollar on their own or whether you know they just get the process going and it happens months later or you know but it would happen i mean we depend on the rest of the world interesting enough the japanese don't need any foreign buyers i mean yeah i mean they have the bank of japan and it's a pretty screwed up situation but they've been going for a long time even before the bank of japan was so aggressive you know the world wasn't buying japanese bonds it was the japanese that were buying the bonds because the japanese had a lot of savings uh the reason that foreigners buy treasuries is because Americans don't have the savings. You know, at one time we did, you know, people, a lot of people want to talk about how, you know, now we have uh, the most debt to GDP ever, uh, except or, you know, comparable to at the end of the Second World War. But people forget that when the Second World War ended, we started paying off that debt. I mean, the debt collapsed you know, to down to maybe from 120 percent of GDP, whatever it was, down to a low in the 30s. You know, I forget when it bottomed out, was it, you know, the 780s or whenever it bottomed out at 30-something percent of GDP. But all that debt was owed to Americans. It was Americans who were buying all those war bonds. I mean, the Japanese weren't buying them. We were fighting the Japanese. We, we, American citizens loaned all that money to the U.S. government. And then when the war was over, you know, we, we dramatically brought down the debt. We have no chance of bringing down the debt. It's going to keep on growing from 120, 130% of GDP where it is now, 150%, 200%, 250%. It's just going to keep on going until it implodes uh, because there is no way to reduce it. I mean, it's already so big that that's impossible. I mean, they're having that problem in Japan, 
um, you know, with their debt. Uh, but I think that the Japanese probably are going to be better positioned to deal with their bond crisis. I mean, they're going to have one or a yen crisis. It's not like they're going to escape the consequences of what they've done. Um, but I think the, there's going to be even greater consequences in the United States for the even greater sins that, that we've committed. Now, as far as treasuries, I think Peter's right. If, if, the, if the Chinese came out and they sold all the treasuries, just the headline of it, you know, yields would spike, you know, there'd be market chaos. It would probably hurt the U.S. initially. But in, to also his point, I think very quickly, the Fed would come out and they'd buy it. It's like they think they owe, own $1.3 trillion. So, you know, you think back to, to COVID, what did the Fed buy? $5 trillion worth of treasuries or whatever it was? <laughs> um, you know, 1.3, what's, you know, yeah, might cause a couple of weeks of chaos, but I think they'd probably buy that. Um, but then what, what would happen then is I think, and, and, I'll, and I'll give an analogy, uh, is that I think even though that would inflict a short-term pain on the United States, I think it would inflict medium-term pain on themselves, on, on China themselves. And the reason I say that is because it's very easy to say, you know, we just won't use dollars anymore. But the, the problem is, is actually doing it. And the example I'll give is, you know, over the last 10 years, and especially over the last two or three years, there's been this big push to move towards green energy, you know, and governments mandated that industries decarbonize and, you know, get away from the old fossil fuels. And they put regulations in against things like coal and, you know, dirty energy. And the idea is that, yeah, we're just going to go to this new green energy and everything's going to be great. But then what happened was there was a crisis, right? And then there was a, there was a, there was a, you know, the COVID crisis and then with Ukraine and all of a sudden, because those new systems weren't up and running fully, they needed that old traditional energy to run. And so gold or oil went up through the roof, natural gas went through the roof. And it's kind of the same thing with currently. I mean, there's a lot of plans to de-dollarize and there's a lot of plans to put new systems in place to transition from the old system to the new system, but they're just not up and running yet. And if we get into a crisis before they're up and running, when that happens, I think, you know, the dollar goes a lot higher. So the reason, the reason they still show up at treasury auctions and the reason they still hold dollars is because until that new system, until that new green energy currency system is up and running, they still need oil. They still need dollars. They still need, you know, treasuries. And so, that's 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 how I think that would play out. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, uh, holding U.S. treasuries and using dollars are two very different things. I mean, there's nothing that stops the Chinese from getting rid of their treasuries, but keeping transacting in dollars. They just don't want to hold on to them. They don't want to uh, buy treasuries with them. They want to just use them to buy stuff, buy real things instead of treasuries. And of course, that is very inflationary here in the United States, because if the Chinese want to buy real stuff with their dollars instead of treasuries, it's, it's treasury prices that will fall and the price of everything that they are buying that's going to go up. And of course, a lot of this stuff is stuff that Americans want to buy. So we'll start to see much higher, my higher prices. But my point I'm making is, yes, even if the, the Federal Reserve can quickly monetize all the debt that the Chinese no longer own, and we take the hit to inflation, because if you print all that money, you know, prices are going to go up and the dollar is going to go down. But it's more of the message that it sends going forward. Well, China's not there anymore. China's not going to be um, buying any more treasuries. And, you know, what are they going to buy? What are the Chinese going to buy with all the dollars that they get when they unload their treasuries? My guess would be they'd buy a lot of gold, you know, and, and so that would push up the price of gold. And that hurts the dollar because, you know, gold is kind of a barometer of confidence in the dollar. You start to really see gold going up. That makes people question the dollar and think, well, maybe we should have gold instead of the dollar. And, you know, you mentioned even before we had this conversation that the Biden administration is thinking of imposing uh, more uh, sanctions on Americans. You know, and they say, you know, it's sanctions. They want to say it's sanctioned China and say Americans can't invest in China. The sanctions aren't on, on China. The sanctions are on Americans. It's they're taking away the freedom of Americans to invest their money where they want to invest. And the worst thing is when the U.S. government forces an American to divest of an investment he already owns, because then he might end up having to get out at a fire sale price. So all of these actions that the U.S. The government might take, they're all against American citizens. They're never against China. They're all undermining the individual liberties and freedoms of Americans, and they make American poor, America poor. 
Uh, not, they don't affect the Chinese. Now, some other investors might get a break because now they get to buy the assets that we have to sell at a fire sale price. But if the Biden administration actually says, we're not going to let Americans invest in Chinese companies, well, that might be the first salvo in that war. How would I respond if I was China? Oh, I'm not, we're not going to invest in your bonds because that's what they invest in now. They buy our bonds. Okay, Americans, you can't buy Chinese businesses. Fine, we're not lending you any more money. See how that? How you, how you like that? Yeah, I think um, a, a takeaway from from this has all kind of been. It sounds like it'd be a disaster for all parties involved. Um, so I hope this doesn't happen. But I appreciate both of you coming on. Brent, did you have like a closing statement you wanted to make on on Peter's comments there? No, I mean it's you know I th again. To your point and what we talked about initially, I don't, I don't think anybody wins in a war, right? And it, unfortunately, it looks like this is where we're headed. Um, I don't think it's a positive for anyone. I just believe that due to a number of institutionalized effects and the number of uh, advantages that the United States has over the rest of the world, that on a relative basis, uh, they, they come out of this uh, on a relatively better, better uh, place. Fair enough. Well, um, thank you both gentlemen for joining Epic Times today. And uh, Hopefully we get another debate soon. Okay. Take care. All right. Thanks for the invite.